It's a joy to be together on this Resurrection Sunday. It's a privilege to share in this celebration with each of you. You know, every day we have to make decisions about what's most important. For instance, if you go to the local coffee shop, you have to decide what's most important. Do I want to like the taste or do I want it to be healthy? It's a very real decision, okay, for me at least. For me, it's always one, <laughs> I, want it, I want to like it. <laughs> healthy, maybe later. I, I want to like it. We make decisions about the importance of things all the time. What is most important? For instance, when we get ready to go for a car ride of you know any length beyond about 10 or 15 minutes, we often let our boys take a toy in the car. With four of them, that can get rather complex. We say, okay, you can pick one toy. And you can see them, they've got two toys in their hands. Like, which one? Which one is most important? Do, do I want the race car or do I want the action figure? Do I want the, the book or the Ranger Rick magazine? Which, which one is most important? Which one is most important? We make these decisions all the time. In life, we are always faced with the question, what is most important? Today, that very question hangs before us. What is most important? We're going to be looking this Easter Sunday morning not actually at the gospel accounts themselves. I hope that you have, through the course of this week, been reading the gospel accounts. If you haven't yet, take time to read the end of any of the gospels and read the story of the resurrection as we celebrate this day. But we're going to be actually in one of Paul's letters, the first letter to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today. If you happen to have a Bible in front of you, let me encourage you to turn there. It's in the New Testament, uh, towards the back of your Bible. There are two letters to the Corinthians. There's one that we're going to be looking at today, the first letter. And this is written to a church that Paul started. He had a huge hand in getting them up off the ground. And this was a church that because of, in many ways, the, uh, the transient nature of that city, the church became very troubled very quickly. In fact, Paul's letter to them was a corrective letter. <laughs> And it's one of the longer letters, so there's a lot of correction going on here. They had issues with unity. They had issues with uh, understanding the centrality of the gospel. They had, under, they had issues with uh, immorality. They had issues with understanding marriage. They had, I mean, we could go on down the list. Every, every chapter, every verse is dealing with another troublesome issue within this church. They even had people among them that said the resurrection didn't happen and didn't matter. They even had people among them there in the church at Corinth that said the resurrection just isn't that important. After all, people don't rise from the dead. And so Paul launches in as he's pulling the, the letter to a conclusion to say, let me remind you about what is most important. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to open up there or turn your Bible on in some cases. If not, the words will be here next to me on the screen. We're going to be looking at verses 3 and 4, and then we're going to skip down to verses 20 through 23. If you have, a, have your Bible, follow along as I read aloud. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Down in verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death. By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The main thing I want you to see this morning is that Jesus is alive. That's the whole point of the celebration 
of the resurrection. Jesus is alive. In fact, in verse 20, he makes that statement abundantly clear. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The question of the resurrection is a massive question. If you're here and you're a Christian, the question, the question of the resurrection is a massive question. If you're here and you're still trying to figure these things out, trying to search through what do I really think about Jesus, the question of the resurrection is still a massive question. Even in the early church, it was huge. Because they had people in the early church, just like we do today, that say, I, you know, the resurrection, uh, not so much. It's not the product of, you know, the enlightenment, of of the rise of materialism and rationalism, these, these major philosophical movements in history. It's not the product of those things to question the resurrection. People have been questioning the resurrection ever since the resurrection occurred. We're not dealing with anything new. They're not new questions before us. But Paul begins by asserting that this is the most important thing. Why? Why is it most important? Well, quite simply, if you want to destroy Christianity, prove there's no resurrection. It's that simple. If you want Christianity to fall apart from its roots, prove that Jesus did not rise from the dead. And it's done. It's over. We need to wash our hands and go home. The resurrection is essential and central. The resurrection cannot be underplayed, undermined, or somehow shoved to the side as non-essential. That's why Paul begins in verses 3 and 4 saying, For I delivered to you as of first importance. What's the most important thing? This is. Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. This is the most important thing. If we were to read through the entire chapter, we'd realize he's dealing with largely in those verses that we kind of hopped over. He's dealing with their questions of if the resurrection didn't happen and the tragic results that come if there indeed is no resurrection. He's working through this saying, we're the worst possible lot of any people trying to believe in Jesus if he's not alive. All four gospel writers highlight the resurrection. It's the summary statement. It's the exclamation point at the end of every gospel account. Were it not for the resurrection, we would not be here today. How many other things do you celebrate from 2,000 years ago? We don't. But because Jesus is alive, we celebrate, we remember, and we rejoice today. The Bible speaks about the resurrection of Jesus with zero ambiguity. It's assumed. There's no hesitation in the language. Yet, there are still many questions that loom as you dialogue with people. Perhaps even in your own mind. How is the resurrection really? Perhaps even here today, you're questioning, can we really trust the resurrection? Well, here are a couple very brief thoughts to help with those questions. As Christians, those of you who believe, who embrace the resurrection, this should encourage you, should help you as you think and dialogue with others who might have questions. And perhaps you're questioning this morning. I welcome the questions. I want you to have the questions because I want us to get to the bottom of what does the scripture teach us about the resurrection. A lot of people say, well, the the resurrection couldn't have happened. But think about it. The disciples, the apostles, were the ones who recorded the story. They're the ones largely responsible for the record of the story of the resurrection. But how did they look at the end of the Gospels? Let's see, they ran away when Jesus was arrested. Uh, They cowered in fear and were hiding. Peter denied Jesus three times. Uh, They doubted that he actually rose again. They don't don't look too good, do they? At the end of the gospel narratives, if you read through, the, 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 the apostles are not shining very brightly. In fact, we even get into the beginning of the church in in the book of Acts, and they're still cowering in an upper room with the doors bolted. 
you're writing a story, want to convince people that something happened and you were one of the main characters, would you paint yourself in that light? I wouldn't. Put my worst day up there in grand display as a central piece to the story? Yeah, this, this is when I really didn't get it together. Hey, there's for all history to read. That's not the way that we would write stories. That's not the notoriety they would have wanted. Notice also that every gospel account records women first at the tomb. Women as the only ones to encounter the angels. This, this is a massively significant point. Because remember, in that day and age, a woman's testimony was not acceptable in a court of law. It was deemed untrustworthy. That was false of their own system. But that's the way it was designed. If the, the apostles were writing this as a convincing narrative, making up the story, they should have put Pontius Pilate down there checking the stone himself. But rather we see women. Women there in every gospel account. Why would you put women at the tomb? Maybe because that's how it happened. Every gospel account records that. The, the other main you know, fact that's missing is the religious leaders of the day stood to lose everything if Jesus rose from the dead. They stood to lose everything. All they had to do to squelch the rumors was bring out the body. Where's the body? There is no body. There are no bones. All they had to do was drag him out and say, look, he didn't rise. We've got him right here. Creepy as that may sound, it would have been easy for them to do, but it didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Because there was no body to drag out of the tomb. He walked out himself. If you combine both sacred and secular records, the resurrection of Jesus is the most recorded event in all of history. If you can believe anything of history, anything written in antiquity, you can believe the resurrection of the dead in Jesus Christ. You also look at the response of the followers of Jesus. The early apostles, 11 of 12, died a martyr's death. What would embolden these people who were cowering in fear to suddenly turn around in the face of the people who put Jesus on the cross and stare them down and say, this Jesus whom you crucified is the one who's doing all of this. He's alive. What would embolden them? You know, lots of people die for lies, but no one ever knowingly dies for a lie. When the pain starts, the lie stops. That's the way it works. But yet every single one of them gives their entire life for this message. Some argue that it only appeared that Jesus died. In the theological world, it's called the swoon theory. He swooned. He passed out. He sunk into a coma. They thought he, they thought he had died, and so they took him down. They laid him down in the, in, the, in the tomb, and then somehow he revived three days later and came out. It, there's a couple problems with that. First is Romans were experts at killing people. Realize this? You read the history. They were experts at killing people. They knew when someone was dead and when someone was not dead. They understood those distinctions. The spear going into the side, puncturing the lung, and blood and water flowing out. That is not a recoverable position. Not to mention he was in a cold, damp tomb for three days with no hydration, no fluids, no, uh, no medical. There's not like an urgent care in there. <laughs> think, think about this. I, 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 sorry, it cracks me up a little bit to think about it. But he's, he's laying there. He couldn't even carry the cross up the hill to Golgotha. Someone had to be drug out of the crowd to carry his cross for him. Yet after three days of being unconscious, he's supposed to get up and move a stone? A huge, massive burial stone from the inside where there's not a corner to grab? (laughs) On the day that Jesus resurrected, he took a 12-mile walk with some of the disciples. Walking uh, on the road to Emmaus, two of the disciples, he joined them and walked nearly the entire track. Now, how many of you ever stubbed a toe? I'm I'm talking really stubbed a toe. You you really stubbed a toe, you're like, man, i got to sit down. Oh, I can't. Got to get all hobbling around the house for three days because you stubbed your toe. Jesus was crucified. And three days later, he's going to stand up and walk 12 miles? <laughs> I don't think so. 
all the evidence, all the scripture, all the truth points to the fact that Jesus is alive. You can bank your life on it. And that's exactly what Jesus calls you to do. Jesus has been raised from the dead. You know, over the course of history, there have been many things that have changed history. You know, this, this technology erupts and then all of a sudden everything changes. Think the wheel. Picture life before the wheel. <laughs> Maybe don't. That, that, suffering, pain, hardship. The wheel comes in. Everything changes. Culture, society, life changes. Think about the invention of running water. Being able to transport water from, from, from the source to where you live. Think about the, the ideas of the advancement in buildings. Think about the advancement in warfare from blades and bows to now, you know, guns and cannons and tanks and bombs. All of these different advancements. Now everything is changed. The world has changed, even in our modern day. Many of you remember the transition from before internet and computers to now everything is Wi-Fi enabled, connected, data, everything. Life changed. With these technologies, the world as we know it is changed. Here's the reality. The resurrection of Jesus, this changes everything. In the resurrection of Jesus, it changes everything. I was in a discussion just this past Friday with a man here locally in town who's not a Christian, uh, praying that he would become a Christian. I know where he works, so I can go back and talk to him some more. But eventually, the, the discussion came around to the fact that Jesus is the one who rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, he's the one that we need to listen to. If some of these other great religious teachers would rise from the dead, we could perhaps have a discussion. But Jesus is the one who rose again. Remember, Jesus told his disciples prior to the cross that he was going to die and then rise again. And remember the words of the angel to, to the women there at the tomb? The words of the angel were, he is not here, he is risen, just like he said. Think about that. Just like he said. So what else is like he said that we need to be trusting today? That you need to believe today? What else is just like he said that you need to believe today? Jesus, by rising from the dead, conquered death. And this means that he is the greatest one to ever walk the planet. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. He is alive. Therefore, you can trust his word. That you can be forgiven. That you can have eternal hope. Christian, be encouraged in your faith by the resurrection. Friend, do not doubt any longer. Rather, turn. And believe because Jesus is alive. The resurrection is real. Jesus is alive. Notice our passage here though. It says that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Verses 21 and 22 explain this. They say, for as by a man came death, by a man has... Excuse me. By a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. They're explaining the second half of verse 20, which says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So how does this work? These two verses, verses 21 and 22, are parallel verses. They line up and stack on top of each other to give us explanation for what Paul is writing. For as by a man came death, in Adam all die. By a man came the resurrection, in Christ all are made alive. Let's look at the first half. In Adam all die. Do you realize that every person will die? That's not shocking news to most of us. But that's exactly what's meant by these words. The story from the opening chapters of Genesis records, if you'll remember, God created all things. He made it good. He created humanity as the crown of his creation, created in his image to rule over the earth under God's overarching rule. Yet we find three chapters in, humanity 
had a different plan. Humanity chose we would rather be our own leaders, make our own rules, and and decide our own rights and wrongs rather than trust in God. By virtue of being created first, Adam was in the position to serve as our representative. Theological category is the federal head. Taking theology notes. He served as our representative, the representative of all humanity. Adam specifically bore this responsibility and therefore his act of sinful rebellion against God plunged all humanity into sin and bound the whole creation into decay. All of us are affected by this. The entire world and everyone in it is broken because Adam sinned. Say, well, wait, that that doesn't sound very fair. I mean, come on, couldn't we have a better representative? Class vote? Can we, pick the, can we pick a better representative? Here, here's the, if I'd have been there, I'd have made the right choice. We wouldn't be in this mess. If it would have been me. Well, well, just think about that for a second. How would you do yesterday? How about earlier this week? How would you do holding your temper when you're driving on I-95? Just <laughs> turn up the heat a little bit. <laughs> how would you, you do last week in dialoguing with your family? How pure were your thoughts this past weekend? You see, the the problem is, is, is that we think that we're somehow better or different than Adam, but we're not. And Adam, our representative, chose to sin against God. Therefore, we are all bound in sin. The only difference, if you'd have been there, is it'd be your name in here in the text. That'd be the only difference. I don't think you want that. Just, I don't. The reality is that we are all sinful, both by nature, in that we are born as human beings. We are sinful by nature and by choice. We choose to do the wrong things. If you doubt that humanity chooses the wrong things, babysit a two-year-old for five minutes. And you will see, it will be proven to you without a doubt that humanity chooses to do the wrong things. And because of that, we all stand guilty before our holy maker. We stand guilty because both by nature and by choice, we have chosen to disobey God. Statistics are not encouraging. Ten out of ten people die. And death is the great equalizer. We've been studying in our in our home groups that meet uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Fridays during the week. We've been studying the book of Ecclesiastes. And we see this over and over again as Solomon is writing, the, the, the teacher, the wisest man to ever live, having the divine wisdom of God. He writes with, with no, no veil over it. He says, listen, death comes to everybody. It doesn't matter, matter whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you're wise or you're foolish, whether you're strong or you're weak, whether you're good or you're bad. All people die. Whether you like them or you don't like them, everyone is going to die. Not to tell you something you don't already know, but that includes you and me. That includes every one of us. The message, the resounding message of the Bible is that every one of us stands guilty before God. Accountable for our sins against him. That's why Jesus had to come. That's why he had to hang on the cross for six hours. That's the it. That he was speaking of when he declared it is finished. The writer of the book of Hebrews makes it abundantly clear when he says, it is appointed for man to die once and after that face the judgment. You and I are both born into Adam. We're human beings. Like it or not, here we are. We're born to human parents who were born to their human parents. And if you go back far enough, born to Adam and Eve. Therefore, we stand in the line to one day face death because all have sinned against God. 
Paul doesn't leave us there. Because the story of the gospel, the story of the scripture doesn't leave us there. Because he says that all in Christ will be raised again. Look at verses 21 and 22 again. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Paul now sets forth that something new has come. Something different. All are in Adam, will die. Now there's a new category. Jesus in the resurrection is the first fruit of those who have died and risen again. Jesus is the first one to be resurrected in an eternal glorified body. A body made perfect that will last forever. Being first ensures the promise that there are those who will follow. Think about that. He's the first fruit. The beginning of the harvest. That means there is a full harvest awaiting to be brought in. The first fruits in the Old Testament was always a significant, uh, a significant concept. Because it was to be given to God. It was to be offered and sacrificed to God. The first fruits were brought to God. Christ is the first fruits. And he is even now in heaven at the right hand of God in his glorified body. The promised resurrection is for all those who are trusting in him. We'll say, well, we go to funerals, we see the body laying there. Why? It, shouldn't it, you know, we... Shouldn't it be quicker? We, we, we walk around, we, we go to the, the cemetery, and we see all these headstones, and you know there's, there's boxes under all of them. Shouldn't it be quicker? We need to have the right view of what life eternal means. You see, in our, in our modern ideas, we, we get these ideas that we're all somehow going to be transformed into little fat cherubs with little tiny wings falling off of clouds somehow. We think that that's what it is to die and, and, and to go to heaven. That's not what the Bible speaks of. The Bible speaks clearly that to be absent from the body, absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. So your soul, the immaterial part of you, what would the scripture often speaks of as your mind, your heart, that part of you, the inside of you, will never die. When this body gives out, you will blink your eyes and they will open in eternity in the face of your maker. Your body will stay for a time. But what does the text say? Look at, look at verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. At his coming... Those who belong to Christ. When this body gives out, your soul doesn't fall asleep. When you see the words fallen asleep in the text, it's a euphemism. We say passed away in our day. It's a euphemism. It's a way of gently saying they died. The soul never dies. God made you as a united whole, body and soul together. For a time, if the Lord tarries, and waits a little longer. We will be separated from our bodies. But that is not the eternal state. Because Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. Your resurrection is tied to his. In that he is first. And when he returns. He's coming for the harvest. And your body will be raised. And made anew. Glorified eternally with him. So here's the key question. What does it mean to be in Christ? Or verse 23, to belong to Christ. What does that mean? Because that, that's the key distinction here. Those who are in Christ will rise again. Those who belong to Christ will be raised when he returns. What does it mean to belong to Christ? In Adam all die. In Jesus, all are made alive. If we are born into Adam, we need to be born again into Jesus. Verse 3 tells us, I think this is a, a key distinction. Verse 3 reminds us 
For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Here is what it means to belong to Jesus. If He took your sins and gave you His perfect righteousness, you belong to Him. That is the good news of the Christian gospel. To belong to Jesus is to believe and to trust that what He did on the cross was all that you need to be right with Him. When He died, He was paying your debts. He didn't have any debts of His own to pay. But yet He offers you a divine trade. He looks to you and says, I will take your sin on Myself. You can have my perfect reward. You see, to be made right in the sight of God is not only to have your sins forgiven, but also for you to be clothed in the perfection, in the the Bible word is righteousness of Jesus. That is what it means to belong to Him. And what the most amazing part of the story is, Is that you belong to Jesus not by earning it, because you can't. Not by doing better, not by showing up at church, but simply by trusting in Him. By turning from trying to earn it on your own. Because that's the way we're naturally wired. We're wired to want to impress those that we like or impress those that that we fear. We're wired to want to impress, to, to achieve But we can't achieve what God demands. So God says, put that down. He's not concerned about your trophy case. Your merit badges. He calls you to trust. To believe. To turn to Him. Confessing your need. And asking Him. bring you in. You know, there's a fascination in our day and age with rebuilding old cars or rehabbing old homes, you know, fixing things and repurposing things, finding junk and making it new. That's that's how Pinterest came about, I think. So many documentaries even now on, on television are celebrating the remodel or the repurposing of old and broken down items. Yet the Bible teaches us that the greatest celebration amongst the angels in heaven is when one sinner repents. One sinner turns and trusts in Jesus. More than resurrecting old junk to a new purpose and new life in this world, celebrate and be a part of the sons and daughters of the resurrection who when Jesus returns, will be resurrected with Him in glory. Christian, rejoice that Jesus is alive. Every day, you should rejoice that Jesus is alive. And rejoice in His promise that He is the first fruits, which means that you, by faith in Him, are part of that grand resurrection. Friend, if you are here and you are unsure about Jesus, you still have questions. Turn from trying to work your way to God. And trust that what Jesus has done will bring you all the way home. Turn to him and trust him and find peace and joy and hope. The hope that you've been looking for. You know, the most important thing is that which matters most importantly. To put it simply. The most important thing is what needs to captivate our minds and our thoughts. It's not the simple discussion, do I want decaf or regular? It's not the simple discussion of so many decisions that we make. What's more important? What do I want more? 
The most important thing is that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again. So that you too one day might rise. Jesus is alive and it changes everything. While every person will die by faith in Jesus, you will be made alive again. Christian, the resurrection of Jesus is your promised hope. Because he lives, you too will live forever. Death is a merciless reminder that all of us are made in Adam. But for all who come to belong to Jesus, death is but a blink of an eye when you will see your loving Heavenly Father welcome you home. Father, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that Jesus is the first fruits, the first one of all those who will rise in the end. Father, I pray that you would burn into our minds and our hearts the joy of the resurrection, the certainty that Jesus is alive and that that would characterize and color every detail of our lives because he is most important. Father, may the glories of your gospel penetrate deep within us today. That we would be changed by your word through your spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray.